Welcome to CGI Voices, where CGI's experts share insights on the latest in federal government management, policy, and technology. I'm your host, Pete Saronis. Sandy and Bob, it's been great getting to know you, your passion, obviously, both when you were in government and now in industry here at CGI is, is as strong or as infectious as, as, as I can feel it in our conversation. I want to pivot into uh, that, uh, what I call conundrum of where we get caught up in the beltway and having been again in the government and now in industry, seeing that buying and selling and a transactional process that it is sometimes trumps what's most important, seeking and solving problems, having conversations about needs and wants, and not so much what keeps you up at night, but here's how we feel in industry, we can support the mission at the IRS or at the Department of Transportation. So I like to hearken back to the open government principles that are transparency, collaboration, and participation across public-private sector. And let's share uh, what it was like so um, why don't we start with you, Sandy, mm-hmm. this time. Uh, when you hear open government, uh, how, how hard or was it hard? And what did you help industry understand when there was that buy-sell so that they can appreciate the mission that you had to support each and every day? So when I was the head of the Federal Transit Administration, I really appreciated the customer who came in and understood the industry, understood the challenges, um, understood what the Federal Transit Administration actually does. Um, Many times you would get uh, uh, potential suppliers coming in and thinking that the Federal Transit Administration actually purchased the train sets. Um, They don't actually purchase the train sets. They fund the train sets, but they're not the actual decision maker in purchasing the train sets or or purchasing the catenary or the signaling communication systems or whatever, whatever that's needed. They provide funding to either the state or the authority, transportation authority, to make those uh, expenditures, but they don't actually do it themselves. So it was always great to have a supplier that came in that understood, you know, what the FTA does and what its mission is. Let me just follow up with that. And Bob, we're going to come to the same question with you because I love what you said in so many words, and I'm going to translate to, please do your homework on my mission. Please understand, because it's in public domain, the challenges we face, the funding, which is in a budget request, usually if people read, tell me I'm wrong, it's there to solve a certain mission problem. And no budget is the same in the federal government. So folks, check those budgets out that are put out um, every year. Even if it's a request, it still tells you the mission challenge. Uh, I love that you mentioned the funding uh, component. Uh, when I was at Energy, the, the owners and operators of a lot of the energy generation, transmission, and distribution was private industry. And I'm not saying the government doesn't do stuff, right, with funding, but they have influence, and they want to make sure the money gets in the right hands of experts. So again, if we think of like Congress and the White House and then our industry partners, um, I appreciate you bringing bringing that point up. Bob, you heard what we talked about, your perspective back in the day and today. You know, it's interesting when you look at, uh, let's say, the IRS – it's part of an ecosystem when it comes to tax administration. Um, I think it was Peter Drucker uh, was uh, uh, quoted that um, c- culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm-hmm. There's been a couple of, uh, of uh, consultants out there that have said, uh, you know, alignment or execution eats strategy for lunch. I came up with my own. I said ecosystem eats strategy for dinner. <laughs> and uh, ecosystem meaning that if you look at the IRS, it, it doesn't operate in isolation because the, the states collect taxes, right? Local and municipalities collect taxes. And um, in that ecosystem, there's a lot of cooperation that goes on. When I started out my career in South Carolina, we pioneered what uh, was then called joint electronic filing, today sort of known as Fed State, where you, know, you file your, your tax return out of a tax, tax offer package, and both your federal and state return move together. 
The IRS collects it, takes the state data, and sends it to the state. Well, that saves, saves the state a lot of infrastructure investment. They don't have to build all these systems to take all these returns directly, right? So, so that's the ecosystem beginning to sort of recognize it needs to work together. But there are other players in, this ta- in the tax ecosystem, and that's tax preparers. So there are over 700,000 active tax preparers in this country. And, uh, you know, doing taxes for people. And over half the tax returns, individual income tax returns in this country, are actually filed through a paid preparer. So there's another key player in this ecosystem. And when the IRS builds systems and builds experience, it's not just the taxpayers – And I don't mean just individual, but also business taxpayers. But it also has to recognize, you know, the the role of tax preparers as representatives. And so it has to build experience and technology and solutions to address the the tax preparers. So you've got states and you've got, um, um, you know, the tax preparer community. You've got businesses. Uh, They're all, you know sort of playing together in this ecosystem. And when you go to modernize, like I had the good fortune to crusade for the modernization of tax filing and payments, we had to uh, really create collaborative uh, uh, mechanisms uh, to to uh, get people to the table to understand and appreciate all the challenges. And it included uh, systems integrators like ourselves, CGI, but it included tax preparers and it included the states. It included representatives of individual taxpayers um, to, to, to really ideate and imagine what that future could look like uh, for purposes of then all of us sort of beginning to work uh, together in, to address it. Now, the, the IRS and I'm going to quote, enjoys a lot of oversight, whether it's GAO or the, you know, the Treasury Inspector General or Congress um, or a lot of private sector sort of uh, groups. Um, but it, it, even though, uh, it, you know, it enjoys oversight, back in uh, probably the late 90s with, uh, with the passage of um, RRA 98, which was the Restructuring and Reform Act for the IRS, you start to you started to really feel a shift to, towards customer centricity. Um, even within the service today, they'll call them taxpayers, but there's evolution um, to embrace the notion customer. And what what I think that indicates is that the IRS appreciates it has a taxpayer responsibility, but there's so many other stakeholders, and all of the stakeholders need to be sort of collectively recognized and treated like customers um, in the way that you render the service uh, uh, to them. Um, And so back in that that sort of time frame, we saw an institutionalization of of, uh, organizations. There there was a a trade association formed at the time, and I happen to have been the founding president, um, called CIRCA. And that trade association is very close in, in the context with providing feedback to the IRS, and the IRS solicits feedback. And CERCA is the Council for Electronic Revenue Communication Advancement. Um, there's another one out there, the National um, uh, or NACTP, which has to do with uh, uh, the National Association of Computerized Tax Processors. There's another good one. But the IRS also has federal advisory committees, and it has uh, – um, four of them, three of them sort of at core, one of them codified in the law in RRA 98, which is the one I mentioned earlier, ETAC. Um, and um, it leverages those for purposes of soliciting citizen input on <clears throat> agenda, on strategy. Um, uh, uh, the IRS also uh, convened a series of uh, what they call tax forums, they're kind of a mini trade, trade association, um, or, or, or trade show, I should say. But the IRS set up a series of tax forums, again coming out of uh, you know the late 90s, where um, it actually runs these over the course of the summer, invites the public and preparers to come. And it talks about where it's going and talks about what next tax season is going to look like and gets feedback, right? So, so the service has been... Um, um, in spite of standing oversight, has been, I think, genuinely um, engaging, and 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 shifting. Even if, uh, as as you said, Sandy, in, in in the terminology it uses internally, 
um, because uh, there are taxpayers, but there are tax preparers. There are states. There are other government agencies like SSA that it needs to exchange data with and so forth. So, so I appreciate that. My next question, which is more direct to and in light of this, is you're in this unique role here at CGI. Your industry, you kind of still think like feds, if I may, because you are. I mean, I spent 25 years, and I can't get the fed out of me. I'm going to ask you in a minute, and we're going to start with Sandy, is what can government be doing better? What can industry be doing better to create that conversation? And it might just be, for example, you know, don't just come in and think in 30 minutes I need to hear a PowerPoint. It might be do some homework and maybe have some specifics. But I want to emphasize uh, one thing that I love that you said is this the federal government, everybody knows who buys and sells, it's a slow burn. There's procurement, there's regulation. You don't just buy a tool for directly from OEM. You have resellers and distributors. You have integrators and just this team, teaming that has to be involved. And I uh, know that in your position here at CGI as a company, it's like you, you need to be that belly button. Obviously, you do a darn good job of it and having folks like you is crucial, uh, but also being able to synthesize a lot of the capabilities technology brings to the table to meet that mission. So um, I, I just want to emphasize for our audience that I valued integrators who actually could do that. And uh, I loved working with, when I was a Fed, folks like you who used to be in the Fed. And again, great get for CGI. So um, thank you for that perspective on the partnership collaboration needed. But let's do that. The leave, and then we'll get into the visionary component here about the future, where we'll talk a little more about some of the cool stuff with data and technology. But, um, Sandy, what can government and industry individually be doing better to create a more effective conversation? Yeah, I really appreciate the question because I, have a, I think I have a really good answer for, for government, and that's have more industry days. Mm. Um, they benefit both sides. The feds benefit and industry benefits. I know with COVID, you know, it was, it's been kind of um, put off. They were put off. It's hard to do them virtually. But now that we're past that, I, think, I, I just think they're really important. It not only is a good opportunity for industry to better understand the so the challenge and the problem that's needed to be solve, solved, solved, um, it, but it gives the federal side a sense of the type of industry players that are interested in solving the problem. Mm. So it benefits really both sides. And then from the industry side, not only do you, you know, Get to meet the decision makers and and meet some of the feds, if you will. Um, you are also meeting with your peers in the industry, and especially in transportation. Usually, the deals, specifically at FAA, are relatively large or, or very large. Um, so you have to have teaming, and you have to bring on suppliers. And Industry Day is really a great way to get those introductions to meet the other companies. So I just think industry days are just really, really critical um, for the federal government to embrace. And, and they are. They're beginning to do that. i just like to see a little more of that. Yeah, I know. And there's a bunch of people who we – there's never a shortage of industry days, events, get-togethers. Every agency puts them on. But, I, but I'm translating what I heard is even when you have that perfect environment, credibility, authenticity, integrity is very important – for that that fostering of a partnership to 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 ensue, so absolutely, it's both sides can do. I like to say a little more effective job and value that time because you may not get another meeting for a while. I always say it's not about the darn meeting; it's go prepared to learn and, as you said, Bob, in many cases, listen and just ideate with that potential customer. Well, that's, go. That's a good point. Um, you know, when I was serving, uh, my door was always open. Uh, especially to, uh, you know, those that wanted to come in, really understand and appreciate mission and strategy. Mm -hmm. Missions are published, but interpreting mission and then appreciating strategy and then going away and coming back with interesting, innovative ideas or mm -hmm. approaches, right? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I always uh, appreciated that for, uh, for sure. And, you know, here, here at CGI, over recent years now, we have really sort of, uh, how, is, how, how shall I say, sort of shifted to uh, and really embracing uh, the, the concept of strategic and consultative selling, which is let's really spend the time up front to engage with um, our uh, federal, uh, you know, uh, clients and customers and, and understand mission, but beyond even mission, understand strategy, 
um, understand, you know, tactics. You know, the strategic operating plan that the IRS released. I think it had, uh, you know, uh, what was it, 42 or so initiatives across 170 projects. Pretty transparent communication about what they were thinking from a, you know, strategy perspective. Um, and, you know, digesting that and understanding what it is that the agencies are trying to accomplish and then bringing, uh, you know, good ideas. And I always say in my role, you know, let's let's solve the business problem before we try to sell the technology. Mm-hmm. What te- what is the business problem? Because maybe the problem isn't. It, it typically could have a, a component of technology, but it, as, you know, as we were saying earlier, it might be about process innovation, right? It might be about change management. Let me just say right? that this is why you two stressing that and being at CGI. I feel that's the job. You look at the process the people and the technology. I just had to jump in because you just used process and innovation in the same sentence, which is so spot on, but yeah. keep your riff. Uh, yeah, and so it's about solving uh, you know, either business challenges or addressing business opportunities. And, and once you've solved them from a business perspective, now let's look at how they're delivered. Um, and there, as I said, there's a, there could be a technology component in that delivery. There could be a, a, a process innovation. It could be a change management. And the other thing that we as an organization that I, I really appreciate is this notion that we may not singularly have everything needed. And so we will reach out and partner. You know, some of it could be delivered by the agency. We may seek other partners to join us in the context of, of delivering the solution because it is about collaboration, partnership. It's about solving the business challenge, addressing the business opportunity. Um, and, and we have, you know, at CGI, uh, we can cross all those domains in change management, in business consulting, um, in technology delivery. Sometimes we think we, we we're thought of um, because of our technology strengths and delivery, uh, but we have the capacity to, to wrap those into holistic business solutions. Technology is not a silver bullet. Uh, you need lots of it. The capabilities combined might meet a mission, and it could inform a new process that is in a continuous state of improvement. Love it. I hope everybody takes that to school before they ask for the next meeting with somebody in the federal government. But let's finish with your uh, vision, right? Where are the pucks going in that hockey sense of uh, we know today that cybersecurity, cloud computing, AI, zero trust, RPA, robotic process automation, mom, if you're listening, um, <laughs> analytics, uh, the Internet of Things. I, technology is a thing, and you both know it, and its application to uh, transform and modernize mission is critical. If you were to paint a picture, transportation, IRS, uh, all of that stuff's needed. Is there some stuff that excites you about, or if you're listening, folks in industry, these are the things, the departments that you served and care about. What would that be? Wow, there's so much in transportation because transportation is really kind of going, is, it, it, it's really changing. It, it's changing so quick. I was at a conference and the presenter made a really interesting observation Five years ago, when their FAA reauthorization bill that I mentioned earlier was passed, UAVs, um, unmanned aerial vehicles, were a paragraph in the bill. Today, it's going to have its own uh, title. Um, Just the advancement of drones. Um, The the coming together of... of, um, NASA and DOT being more in line is really has happened um, quickly in the last four years. Uh, think the knowledge that's out there or the, or the creativity, the innovation that's going on in all kinds of aircraft. You know, it's so funny. Will we be like the Jetsons someday with jet packs? And maybe it's, it's being certainly looked at and considered. Um, autonomous vehicles. I mean, there's just so much going on in transportation where they need a CGI they need- to, to come in and help them organize that, manage that, help them understand that, bring 
systems together. I mean, it's all of this, uh, the idea of the highway being a smart highway and being able to talk, if you will, to the vehicle. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's unlimited what's going on today in transportation, which is just so exciting. And, and I'm going to apologize for uh, jumping in there for a second, sure. but I'm hearing you say you brought it home, UAVs, a new ac- another acronym, right? It's a drone. Yep. It's communicating wirelessly, 5G. Uh, it probably needs to be stored somewhere cloud. Yep. It needs to be secure cyber. Uh, it's the Internet of Things, yes. Yep. And we need the creature comforts of real-time streaming information, yada, yada, yada. It's my geeky person uh, in me coming out where you need it all. Yes. But you, you, you talked about it was a paragraph, and now it's a thing. It's, it's a section. It's like we need it. Yep. We have to embrace it. And in a world that says don't trust anything, zero trust, how do we enable those communications? My, one of my favorites is whenever I drive on the Pennsylvania Turnpike to Pittsburgh, mm-hmm. uh, being at Energy, Department of Energy and Transportation, wireless power transfer. Uh-huh. I mean, charging stations seem like, yeah, that's state of the art. Well, the future is, why do we have to stop and plug in and do whatever? Why can't it just charge? Because guess what? You can. It's being studied in our national lab. So the innovation and knowing that it's all, if not one potpourri, this is the kind of thing I'm hearing about. DOT seems like it needs it all, but come in and focus on how cloud or cyber or AI can meet the need of maybe the drones that have to do a lot of that information collection. Is that a fair? Yeah, it really is. And, and you know, I, I know people criticize the feds or Department of Transportation saying they're not moving quick enough. And, <clears throat> and I think we all understand that. They understand that. But you also have to remember, you know, safety, uh, critical mission. Um, so you have to put that in perspective. No, you don't want to have paralysis. You don't want that. Um, but you need to balance the actual innovation that's going on in transportation, the incredible paradigm change, and then, of course, the, necess- the necessity of safety. You know, it's so funny, there's all this talk about high-speed rail, and I always like to say, you know, the passenger doesn't care how fast the train is going. The passenger only cares that the train gets there when, the, when it says it's going to get there safely. That's what they care about. It's not the speed. It's the reliability. And, um, you know, it's, 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 and, and, and that's what transportation, you know, the technology, we want it to be able to do the things absolutely. But we also make sure that it's reliable and it's safe. And that's the other side. I love it. I was coming over to Bob here. I mean, you look at the 4.1 through 4.8 of, of technology road mapping that the IRS cares about. But to, to riff off, off, Sandy, you have reliability, which is not the same as resilience, and security mm-hmm. and safety. Those are the buzzwords that technology better enable. Bob, vision. Yeah, I would say, interestingly enough, in this report that surfaced yesterday, one of the recommendations by this Federal Advisory Committee was, and I think it's really dawning in this pivot uh, for the IRS, is to discard the lift and shift. Um, it's not a case of, you know, let's, let's, let's take what the old system is and just put it into a new language, right? Um, it's really, you know what, let's reinvent text, you know, sort of, uh, um, let's say, tech, uh, the technology and, and the experience around tax administration, reinvent it completely, um, as opposed to, you know, we're going to take an old system and put it on a new database and, you know, and, and, and code it in a new language, right? Because if you think about the, the financial services, and, and I, you know, I, I, uh, as a runner, I, used to, I, I like to tell people that um, the IRS uh, has been sort of running 20-minute miles, uh, running this marathon at 20-minute mile pace. And the, uh, the technology has been advancing at world-class 5-minute mile pace. Um, and then financial services is kind of upfront um, and close. When you think about your relationship with your bank, as a as a simple example, you know you do all your banking on a phone now, right? Um, and, and and pretty much can. So you know picking up the pace is certainly a part of it, and it's been difficult to do with uneven, let's say, funding over this period of time. But if you look at the technology space right now in financial services, world class financial services. Um, and the advancements that have been made around cloud uh, or around RPA or uh, AIML, you know, artificial intelligence, um, uh, machine learning, 
those advances are being embraced by financial services, and the IRS is still trying to figure out how to get the individual master file out of an old, you know, uh, archaic language off, off an old archaic database. Uh, and so it's almost like, you know what, let's go just reinvent and, 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 and think about, you know, this from a, uh, a stakeholder, taxpayer, tax preparer, state's experience and sort of rebuild this and leverage these technologies that are in market and take a look a few years ahead at what's coming. Um, ultimately, you know, we what we as a nation expect is that the IRS would collect, as I said at the outset, uh, the proper amount of tax, you know, no more, no less than what the law uh, requires in the context. But we, but it's also a very strong trust relationship because when I give you my sensitive, you know, tax or my f sensitive financial information um, in the throes of filing a return, I want to know that I can trust that, uh, you know, that day is protected, right? So the whole zero, you know, sort of zero trust in the cybersecurity space. So so the IRS as a financial services institution, um, and, and when we engage with our financial services institutions in the bank, that's a trust relationship. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when the IRS thinks about what it needs to do, you know, it needs, you need to trust it's getting just the right amount of money. You need to trust that it's chasing down the fraudsters and those that aren't complying and assuring that they do, right, and enforce. And then you need to trust for sure that that data that you've provided them is protected, right? And I would characterize that the IRS, uh, from a tax administration perspective, having uh, sat in my prior role and had occasion to visit, you know, uh, around the planet, Imagine the scale of what we do in the context of the, the, the money that we collect and the transactions that agency processes and the data it, it's challenged to protect. It's huge. And so uh, um, as it begins to pivot here, especially with, the, with this, uh, um, this IRA 22 funding, it's starting to shift from a I've got to evolve instead of evolution how about revolution? Mm. Let's go ahead and make that big leap mm. and reimagine the experience and rebuild it and, and collaborate with the private sector and the citizenry in doing that. Well, I'm going to grab that and just remind from an IRS perspective, much like, you know, Sandy, you were pushing the, the safety and, and that sort of thing. Uh, taxpayer experience, core taxpayer services and enforcement folks are, are two of the modernization pillars at IRS. Uh, the other two of the four being modernized IRS operations and then cybersecurity and data protection. And anybody who reads that who's in industry is going to say, oh, we can do that. I encourage you to read the bullets, and I won't read them all, but it's using the innovative technology that both of you have said that are needed. D cloud, agile, DevOps, application programming interfaces. Newsflash, align that requirement to what the mission is, and that takes the conversation and ideation. I heard the word data integrity and data providence reign supreme so that people are safe on the roads and that, you know, the tax information is legit and we get the right dollars back for, for what we're, we're providing. So, hey, listen, this was amazing. I love this. We hit so much and can talk for hours. I want to thank you both. I know I was educated, informed, enlightened. I know the audience will be, and I sure hope people are Googling when they're not driving who you two are, and shout out to CGI for uh, having you in their culture. So it was great well, to see you. you. Thank yeah, you so thank much. You, Pete. Yeah. you bet. You can find CGI Voices on your preferred podcast platform or watch the video version on YouTube. Subscribe or follow and spread the word to your colleagues. CGI Voices, expert insights for federal decision makers.